my topic today is Mohayan in Tibet. And in post 14th century Tibetan art, Mohayan or Huashan in Tibetan is often portrayed as one of the 18 arhats whose image has merged with the famous Buddha Heshang from China. However, I'm not an art historian and this talk is not, talk is not about Mohayan's reincarnation in Tibet as an arhat. Suffice it to say, with the passage of time, Mohayan is capable of turning himself into an unrecognizable figure in Tibetan Buddhism. So my talk today focuses on Mohayan as a Chai master in Tibetan sources and how his image in these sources differ from the image in the Chinese text titled Da Shen Dun Wu Zheng Li Jue or the judgment on sudden awakening being the true principle of the great vehicle. Hereafter, I will refer to it as the judgment. The judgment was composed shortly after 794 and has been translated to French by Paul Demieville. In a paper published this year, I tried to argue that Demieville misjudges the interlingual nature of the text and underestimated how effective the communication between Mohayan and his Indo-Tibetan opponents was. So his uh, French translation perhaps needs some kind of modern update. So there, there's also one passage from Kamala Shila's third Pavanakrama that reveals to us how Mohayan was understood by his contemporary Indo-Tibetan opponents. So this passage became the source of the debate episode in later historical works. And so it started with Washe, and through Washe, the, 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 the passage from the Pavanakrama went through many iterations in later historiographical works. In the Dunhuang corpus, there are several manuscripts contain, that contain passages attributed to Mohayan. These manuscripts are mostly copied in the 9th and the 10th century. Another important 10th century source is the Santamidran or the eye lamp of meditation compiled by an early Ningma master called Nupchen. I will refer to it simply as the eye lamp. So most scholars assume, I think correctly so, that there is not much differences, difference between Mohayan in the judgment and the Mohayan in the third Pavanakrama, even though the latter attempts to present Mohayan's position with the maneuver of reductio ad absurdum. It has been generally assumed that it has been generally assumed that Mohayan, who participated in the debate, somehow informed the 9th century and the 10th century sources, even though no scholar has really discussed the differences or the lack of differences between the two. In the same manner, the doctrinal discrepancy between the relevant discussion in the Bhavanakrama and the Mohayan in Tibetan historiography has not been scrutinized. My argument in this paper is simple. There is simple, there, there is no discernible relationship between Mohayan in the debate and the Mohayan in the Dunhuang Tibetan fragments attributed to him. And in ILAMP, there is no relationship between the relevant sources from the 9th and the 10th century and the Mohayan in later Tibetan historiography. Therefore, we are dealing with more than one Mohayan, hence Mohayan's in these sources. 
Gomez, a synthesizing the existing Japanese scholarship proposed in 1983 that five manuscripts from Dun Huang perhaps contain different portions of what was originally a single text titled Gate of Immediate Access to Meditation. His main argument is that because there are passages in the eye lamp that overlap with the Dunhuang fragments, the fragments, the five fragments might belong to a single text. However, upon closer examination, I think this hypothesis seem suspect at best. For in instance, the codes in the eye lamp are on the different rubrics such as Mohayan's treatise on meditation, Mohayan's scripture, etc. These titles do not suggest that there was a single long text, let alone a text titled The Gate of Immediate Access to Meditation. One of the texts titled Great Chinese Treatise on Mohayan's Meditation is actually attributed to Bodhidharma in East Asia. So the Alamp actually tell, the, tell us that the five Dunhuang fragments should not be considered as a portions of a single text. In fact, we cannot even assume the pericopies in the single manuscript belong to the single text. It seems to me that the ending mark the ending mark should be interpreted as the end of a quote belong to Mo Heian, and the rest of the text has nothing to do with Mo Heian. The pericopes in the eye lamp attributed to Mo Heian should not be taken at face value. So here's an example. According to Mo Heian's meditation, having meditated for an extended period, sometimes Many Buddhas and Bodhisattvas appear to you. Sometimes you think you have a fight for supernatural powers. Sometimes you see all kinds of miracles. All these are delusional thought you sh you're practicing in because they are simply demons you should not think about or be attached to them. So this is uh, actually just, uh, this is a passage strictly coming out of uh, the Shulun Yanjing pseudo Shulam Gama Sutra and has no connection to Mo Heian's teaching. So what can we extrapolate from uh, the Dunhuang Chan manuscripts? So there were Tibetan collections or selections of uh, Chan sayings uh, attributed to different masters circulating in the 9th and the 10th century. However, most of the, these sayings attributed to Mo Heian are mostly unrelated to Mo Heian in the judgment. And more importantly, the division between Southern Chan and the Northern Chan is missing in Tibetan sources. And we have a two, so just to clarify the background, we have a two gradualist subtests that div divides uh, an earlier divide between opponents and the proponents of which Chan and a later divide between Northern Chan and the Southern Chan. And uh, so, for Buddhist opponents of Chan, such as uh, Kamala Shila, sudden awakening is an impossibility because liberation must be preceded by gradual cultivation that features various kinds of training. Northern Chan clearly embraces uh, the idea or the rhetoric of uh, sudden awakening for practitioners oriented to Northern Chan. Sudden awakening simply means that, that Chan meditation is the only fast track with which one can circumvent gradual cultivation. 
the Samya debate had nothing to do with the disputes between Northern Chan and the Southern Chan, because no Southern Chan figure was involved in the debate. Tibetans in the 9th and the 10th century paid no attention to the intra-Chan debates and saw Chan simply as a movement that advocated alternative techniques of Chan meditation, of med techniques of meditation. So he, now I'm gonna turn to the testament of Wa or Washe. So Washe is the earliest historical work that uh, described the Samya debate and it either directly or indirectly informed other important historical works composed uh, later in the later centuries. However, with regard to Mohayan's doctrinal positions, the Testament of Wa has only one source, the third, Pavanakrama. So here's the example. So the Testament of Wa inserts the following into the passage from Pavanakrama. For those who with the sharp mental faculties, both the virtuous and the evil deeds are obscurations. Those who do not do anything, do not think of anything, do not conceptualize and do not objectif objectify anything, attain the 10th stage via a sudden entrance. So this passage portrays uh, Mohayan as, as an advocate of absolute quietism and moral annihilation. But this is markedly different from Mohayan's position in the judgment. So in the judgment, he says, if one correctly understands the nature of the principle of reality, one needs to sit and meditate. If one cannot under correctly understand it, one needs to chant the sutras, join the palms, prostrate and perform good deeds. There's nothing wrong with the generation of merit. So I don't have the time to unpack everything here. Suffice it to say for Mohayan, it's not about whether one is smart or stupid. It is about whether one understands the reality with the Prajna wisdom, even though he defines the Prajna in a way different from Kamala Shila's definition. More importantly, it does not mean that practitioners should avoid acts of merit generation after attaining the correct understanding of reality. It is only in the context of a seated meditation that one needs to practice no thought or no objectification. As I have explained, the Tibetan sources ignore Mohayan's Northern Chan orientations. One of the episodes featured in the Testament of Wa attempted to paint Mohayan as someone who rejects Yogacara philosophy. So here is the passage. The, according to the Testament of Wa, the subtext took up the Shatasahashrika Prajnaparamita, Prajnaparamita in 10,000 verses, 100,000 word verses, shut the doors of the Chan monastery at which they resided and studied debate for two months straight. The Samdi Nirmuchana Sutra, uh, Yugachara Sutra, was uh, trampled over, bundled up, and uh, discarded. So, this is uh, far away from the fact that Northern Chan took Yugachara philosophy actually seriously. They discuss uh, a lot of uh, Yugachara ideas. Uh, and this is as uh, being kind of treated by Professor Yamabe. So this is, so for example, the judgment uh, cites uh, the Lankavatara 20 times, far exceeding the frequency with which it cites uh, Prajna Paramita texts, uh, such as the uh, Raja, Raja Chalika. So the Lankavatara is actually considered a central text for Northern Chan. 
And it's actually more interestingly, it's the same, it is also considered a central text for Kamala Shiva. So what do we know? Uh, so in, to conclude, in the ninth and the 10th century Tibetan sources, Mohayan was considered just a generic Chan monk who proposes various alternative techniques of meditation. Knowledge about his specific positions in the judgment was lost in the ninth and the 10th centuries. Fragments and the sayings attributed to him should not be taken at face value. And interestingly, lineage as a concept was not important to the Tibetans, even though it appeared to be of a paramount importance to the followers of Chan movement in the 10th century or in the 11th century. In Tibetan sources, the Chan simply means meditation. And in the post 11th century Tibetan historiography, Muhyen becomes an absolute quietist and more nihilist, which is actually not the position, it's different from the positions presented in the judgment. Thank you.